uh, and thank you for coming to what we hope is going to be a very interesting session uh, with some lively debate around it. But my request to all of you is that we, we know about electronic cigarettes, we have read something about it, but keep an open mind when you are looking and uh, listening to the different presentations being done today. Uh, we have got four pre excellent presenters, including myself. <laughs> uh, so we'll have about 15 minutes for each presentation and then five minutes of discussion. If we are running late, what we'll, I'll request you to do is that hold off to any burning questions till the end of uh, the four presentations because your question might be answered by the one uh, preceding the other one. So uh, as we start the session, I would like to request uh, Joanna Cohen is not, couldn't be with us, but Ryan, uh, her colleague, is uh, going to present on the regulations on the electronic cigarette. So, Ryan, it's over to you. Thank you very much. And yes, I apologize that Joanna is not here. I'll do my best to go through this. This is, it, uh, just to echo those sentiments, I think this is going to be a super interesting session. And uh, I, I think we're, we're talking about ends today. I think it's described as ends in the um, uh, abstract electronic nicotine delivery systems um, because these are devices that in the context of tobacco control are relevant because they're delivering nicotine. But just as a, something to keep in mind, especially considering the folks that attend this union conference, um, these devices can deliver a whole range of constituents into the lungs. They can deliver um, a range of drugs. They, we, we're seeing them used for THC and, and opioids, and they can also deliver different medicines. So I think this is a, a topic area that we're going to see discussed uh, at length and um, increasingly in the, in the future. Um, I want to uh, acknowledge uh, some of the uh, colleagues that worked on this project. We, We've tried at the Institute for Global Tobacco Control to build a repository of every national level policy that's regulating uh, electronic uh, e-cigarette devices. We thought this would be easy, um, <laughs> uh, and it's, it's turned into a huge, tremendous um, job. We were funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to do this initially, and then we've um, continued with funds from the Bloomberg Initiative. Io and Elaine uh, did the heavy lifting for this work. Uh, and if there's one thing I leave with you with today is this tool or this resource that we're, we're, we have now, it's launched and it's available to be used, and we're constantly updating it. Um, the, the idea about policy is, is always dynamic. It's dynamic, it's changing, it's being updated. Uh, even in the last sort of two years that we've been working on this project, we've seen um, big changes. So on this website, if you go to the Institute's um, homepage, and you can be redirected the, to this landing page for the country laws regulating e-cigarettes. And this will allow you to search countries by, by country, um, or you can uh, search by regulatory mechanism or the product classification. You can sort of, if you're interested in knowing um, what a specific country is doing to regulate, you can look that up. And we've included links uh, to documents that are either the laws that are being used to regulate um, or the um, web pages from the Ministry of Health that is characterizing and describing their regulatory approaches. And we've done this uh, using sort of web citations, so there should be no dead links. Of course, if you're going through this and you find something has been updated in your, in your home country or you're aware of an emerging policy, we also ask that you let us know so that we can keep things up to date. E-cigarettes are a whole class of products too, and it's, it's hard to sort of speak about them individually because they're very different one end of the spectrum to the other. But just in the context of policy, it's important to know a little bit about what they're made of and, and what... Um, ingredients are included. So these devices typically include a battery that's used to heat an atomizer or an element that is able to aerosolize a solution. The solution is typically made of propylene glycol and or glycerin. And within that solution, which we often call e-liquid, uh, there is or can be nicotine. And if there's nicotine, um, there's probably a flavor in it as well. Nicotine on its own is very bitter and it's not very palatable. Um, and so when we talk about regulation and product regulation, often we're talking about either aspects of the, the, the device, um, sort of in a safety context, or we're talking about the e-liquid and um, the ingredients that are going in. I'm going to describe what we did to try and conduct this global scan, and then I'll describe the sort of different regulatory classifications and mechanisms that are being used globally. 
Um, there was a very important report um, by the World Health Organization in 2014 that was prepared to support the, the COP6. And uh, the WHO surveyed all member countries uh, to describe what they were doing in terms of regulation for Easter grads. That survey was completed. There's about 200 countries in the world. 90 completed the survey. When we tried to figure out which countries were doing what, we started with those 90 countries. We theorized that perhaps higher income countries might be more likely to have policies, the rationale there that the e-cigarettes are still um, in a, when you're purchasing a system, the entry point is still more expensive than cigarettes. So we thought maybe higher income countries would be more likely to have markets and therefore be more likely to have um, policy. We also used a tool that we've developed at Hopkins called Tobacco Watcher. It is uh, an online tool that searches the world's media. So you can look up, um, it scans uh, in over 20 languages and you can find media reports. So we were able to use Tobacco Watcher to try and identify other jurisdictions that had policies. We found 21 countries there. Um, we, even in the time period of doing this scan, we have had some policies, uh, countries that had policies that have since been rescinded or um, uh, or are no longer in effect. Um, at the end of the day, when we've looked all over the world, we found 68 countries that are regulating e-cigarette or other terms for those that class of devices at the national level. Um, of course, lots of, lots of countries and states do have policies that are regulating, especially depending on how they're organized uh, at sub-national levels by states or provinces or even cities. Um, but we've found 68 that have national level laws as of three weeks ago. Um, we say laws, but of course they're not all laws. Some are um, decrees or decisions uh, or notices, but um, we'll just characterize them all as laws in this case. Um, some have um, specific laws. So 36 countries that we identified have a new law that they have written specifically to regulate these products. Uh, there are um, uh, several countries that uh, have added amendments to their laws. In most cases, that is they took their tobacco control law and explicitly added in e-cigarettes. So the same sort of criteria are now being applied to these devices around sale and age of purchase and when and where you can use them, um, advertising laws. Um, there are a whole suite of laws that when jurisdictions review their, these devices in the context of other laws, they um, considered that they had existing laws on the books that e-cigarettes would fall under. Uh, in some instances, this is because they contain nicotine or, um, um, so for example, there's four countries in the world that have specific wording uh, around nicotine being used as a poison or um, as hazardous substance. A lot of that originates from the use of nicotine as a pesticide. Uh, so a device that has an e-liquid with nicotine in some jurisdictions then gets classified as a poison or hazardous um, substance because of those existing laws. The point being that there's a lot of jurisdictions that are regulating e-cigarettes using laws that were not necessarily written with the intention of regulating e-cigarettes. So I think we're going to see a lot of uh, um, changes uh, in the near future. So how are um, laws and the product classification um, lined up? So in some jurisdictions, e-cigarettes, especially in places that have written their own laws, they are classifying these products as e-cigarettes or ends largely. Those are the terms that are being used. In some um, jurisdictions, uh, d depending on the definition of a uh, tobacco product, um, these devices are sometimes being classified as a tobacco product. Or there's other language like derivative and substitute and imitation or surrogate. In some cases, um, uh, these laws have been written in such a way that uh, I think the original intent was to minimize things like toys that look like uh, cigarettes or candies that look like cigarettes. And so the way the law is worded, it's to restrict anything that sort of mimics uh, something that resembles or resembles the act of smoking. So again, probably not within the intent of um, uh, an e-cigarette device. Um, depending on uh, the wording of the product, uh, it might be classified as medicinal if the um, person or the corporation selling a product is making medicinal claims. Um, and in some jurisdictions, they're just classified as um, uh, consumer products and would be subject to regulations around anything that might be battery operated, for example. Uh, in most cases where the laws have set minimum age, uh, they align with the uh, country's um, uh, regulations around how old you need to be to purchase tobacco products. Um, 
most countries are 18, um, some are 19 or 21. Um, we often get asked uh, at our scan, well, how many countries have banned them? How many countries have just banned e-cigarettes? Which, of course, is a very difficult thing. You can ban aspects of the sale, but you might not entirely ban, for example, personal use. So there might be a ban on sale, but not a ban on having them. So the, you know, to answer who has a ban, is uh, there's, there's a lot more nuance to it than that. Um, some jurisdictions have prohibited uh, their sale if they contain nicotine, or they've been specific that it's not banned, but because of uh, what's in them, they would need to go through a specific market authorization process. And um, most of those countries, no product has yet done that. And then there are some um, jurisdictions that have regulations that uh, restrict explicitly cross-border sales. Okay, uh, advertising, promotion, and sm sponsorship. Uh, we. Uh, we did find 48 countries that have some policy restricting some dimension of these sort of marketing um, classifications. Pr surprisingly, prior to the EU um, and their tobacco product directive, there was very little explicit um, policy around sponsorship. So that was something that was being slipped or, or uh, was not. And, and we were seeing some interesting sponsorship of uh, different events and uh, whether they be sporting. Um, there was some uh, pride parades in America last year that were sponsored by e-cigarettes. Um, just to um, give you an example of what's happening there. Packaging, this is a sort of a broad um, collection of um, regulations that in include things like child safety. A lot of concern that the e-liquids might be consumed by a child, um, especially some of them have packaging that um, has historically looked uh, quite enticing. Um, and so there's been um, uh, 14 countries we identified that have, have enacted regulations federal regulations around uh, making sure that they're safer for children, harder to get into. Um, their uh, health warning is, um, is sometimes included in sort of packaging restrictions. Um, and we've seen a merchant at that, uh, particularly in Europe with the TBD. Um, we are seeing um, content disclosure and as well um, the idea that the packaging can be used to sort of help promote uh, or ex extend um, promotions through that. So there's jurisdictions that are beginning to regulate that as well. Um, Uruguay, bless them, have um, uh, restricted trademarks and patents with the respect to um, uh, e-cigarettes, which is, I think they're the only jurisdiction in the world who, who has done that. Okay, we talked a little bit earlier about product regulation, the idea of um, using policy to set limits on nicotine concentration or volumes around how big the containers, if you're getting a closed system, how big they can be. Um, I think, it, did we land on 20 milligrams? Yeah, so in the EU, there is a, a, a set concentration, so the e-liquid can't have more than 20 milligrams per milliliter of e-liquid solution. Um, of course, uh, the actual dosing is dependent on how it's used and how the device is operating. So in some ways, those restrictions are um, becoming moot in the context of evolving technology. Um, there um, are um, safety and hygiene requirements explicit uh, in some laws. Um, and ingredient and flavor regulations, this is something that certainly is being talked about a lot. There's a lot of interest and curiosity, especially when we saw some scientific reports associating specific ingredients that were associated with things like popcorn lawn. So there's a real interest in um, some constituents being explicitly regulated or at least uh, enacting um, policies to have more rigorous testing. Um, the issue being that a lot of these uh, constituents or ingredients that are added have been tested for, for consumption, for um, being eaten, um, but they have not necessarily been tested for inhalation. Okay, and then we're starting to see there's 13 country, countries that have, have regulations requiring um, the manufacturers and retailers to notify um, the whatever authority um, uh, prior to the introduction of the market and um, different annual reporting and um, reporting of constituents and, and um, similar. Okay, we're starting to also see increasing um, discussion and regulation. 33 countries we identified have um, or regulate the use uh, when and where people can use e-cigarettes. It's largely restricting in the same places that have restricted um, indoor smoking. Uh, and. Uh, three countries, Cambodia, Jordan, and UAE, um, ban its use entirely. So I guess in the whole country. <laughs> T 
tax is always an interesting policy, and we've learned a lot from tobacco control in terms of how we can use tax to um, influence use. Um, and uh, I think when we started this, we only had one country that was applying tax. And there's all sorts of different um, approaches and how this is being applied. Some is based on absolute value. Some is based on a proportion of tax relative to the amount of nicotine that's within the product that begins to get at a sort of relative harm sort of construct. Um, if you want specifics, we can go through them uh, one by one. Like I said earlier, there is a lot of activity and policy that's being enacted at um, subnational, so we're not necessarily capturing all the policy innovations. But one of the object objectives of this talk or this um, component of this symposium was to introduce like the range of policies that can be enacted. So New York City is one of those jurisdictions that's rolled e-cigarettes within their tobacco control policies. So now, um, uh, and they have uh, more comprehensive restrictions, including uh, no, no sales of e-cigarettes to anyone under 21, consistent with their tobacco, and no use in anywhere where smoking is prohibited, even parks and beaches. And then um, we're seeing there's a, a bit of a discussion emerging around when and where to allow people to use devices in enclosed like workplaces, for example, and there's been some explicit jurisdictions that have um, explicitly restricted use uh, in enclosed uh, workplaces. So again, please visit our uh, policy scan and, uh, and um, uh, maybe double check that your country you think is up to, day, up to date. And if there are things that emerge in the weeks and months to come, please let us know. You can uh, reach me there. Thank you, Ryan. We have time for a couple of questions, if there are any or... Hopefully they're not too specific about a specific <laughs> country, because <laughs> there's 68. <laughs> or so. any clarifying question from Ryan? I can't really see you, so you have to. <laughs> okay, let's, let's move on to sure. the next presentation. Thanks, Ryan, and I'm, I'm sure that by the time all the four presentations are done, there will be more questions. So the next presentation is uh, <laughs> my dear colleague and friend uh, from the University of Stirling, uh, Professor Linda Bald. Uh, I'll, I'll need 10, 15 minutes just to introduce her, but just to say that she's been leading this debate uh, from the University of Stirling and various other hats that she wears uh, on e-cigarettes in the UK and globally. So it will be... Thank you very thank much. Thank you very Susan. much for um, coming today. Delighted to be here. It's lovely to see everyone, although as Ryan says, I can't actually see you. But um, <laughs> Right, so I have been doing research on smoking cessation for almost 20 years, and I suppose my priority in the trials and studies I do is to support people to move away from tobacco. So that's the sort of background to my approach to electronic cigarettes and also that of many of my colleagues. And I'm just going to use the term e-cigarettes, but as Ryan has already very clearly pointed out, there are multiple terms and some of them are contested. So these are really important in this field. Uh, many of us who uh, speak in favor of electronic cigarettes are accused of having links with the tobacco industry or at least e-cigarette manufacturers. I have none of those links and I don't have any intention of having any in the future. So I'm just going to start off with a few thoughts on the international context. This is a very international meeting and as Ryan's already very clearly mapped out, the country's approaches to these devices vary hugely. I'll then tell you about our research in the UK and the data we have. I talk a little bit about nicotine and tobacco dependence because I think that's crucial to why people are using electronic cigarettes for better or worse. And then I'm just going to show you the UK figures which are just an example of one country. In some ways they're similar to figures in the US but there are lots of other countries where the, the, the situation is very different. Say something briefly about safety, then crucially do they look promising for smoking cessation and then what do the public think of electronic cigarettes. So again, a lot of UK data but try and think about how this potentially relates to your country or how um, it might be relevant to you. I don't need to tell anybody in this room about the harms uh, uh, and the huge burden on health from tobacco. So internationally, as Ryan said, uh, the regulatory framework is very varied and I just use one example here of uh, one part of India where a retailer who had chosen to try and sell electronic cigarettes uh, had received a, a prison sentence for doing so and, and obviously we know that there are some forms of bans or some form of illegal framework in more than 50 countries and I suppose this is in the context that many states are regulating heavily these devices but at the same time and I'm sure you all in the, in the room would agree there's so much more we could do on the effective measures for tobacco control that we know work and just are not properly implemented in, in many countries and that's a real missed opportunity. So where are we in the United Kingdom? 
Well, in September, we issued a statement, and these organizations are our main public health bodies in the UK, uh, many of which I work closely with, saying that the UK public health community makes clear that all the evidence suggests that electronic cigarettes are significantly less harmful than smoking, and current smokers should not be discouraged from using them. Um, and I'm going to just take you through why I think we are different from so many other countries in our approach to e-cigarettes. But just briefly before I do that, that does not mean that the UK is not regulating these devices. We have introduced and have been required to introduce through the European Tobacco Products Directive a really quite significant range of regulations. We are banning, or we have banned, almost all forms of electronic cigarette advertising. And in our own, uh, where Essan and I live in Scotland, uh, there's additional regulations coming in on that. Uh, we have nicotine concentration limits, we have age of sale laws, we now have a notification scheme which is intended to make the consumer products um, safer, uh, better quality. We have restrictions around packaging so they have to be child safe. We will have a health warning in all the products. This is a regulatory framework and we need regulation. Um, so it's not as if uh, nothing is in place. So when you do that, when you regulate, you then have to ask, well, what are, the, what are the benefits of continuing to make the devices available? And for us, I think the main prize is adult smoking cessation while keeping a very careful eye on protecting children uh, from not using nicotine-containing products when they not, would not otherwise have done so. One of the reasons why we might be different, and I do think we are because I give this type of talk a lot in different countries, is because we had the furthest to go. We had uh, some of the world's, if not the highest, smoking rates in the 1950s, over 80% amongst men. We still have one in five smokers, and the report we published last year shows that we have almost completely failed some aspects or some elements of the, um, uh, the adult smoking communities. We have almost seen no change in smoking rates amongst people with long-standing mental health conditions, amongst people in prisons, amongst women who are, are smoking in pregnancy from more deprived circumstances. These people, uh, these individuals, my colleagues uh, and those living in communities around me in the West and Central Scotland, uh, we still face huge challenges and, and we need to try and do more uh, for those groups. So Michael Russell, who trained many of uh, the tobacco control researchers in the UK, famously said smokers smoke for the nicotine, but they die from the tar. And our approach to tobacco harm reduction really has its origins in Michael's work. And what we've done just briefly is we've produced national guidance on tobacco harm reduction, which says that when you already have an effective comprehensive tobacco control framework, and we've done a lot in the UK as you have in many countries, then something additionally we can do is to provide support to smokers who want to stop and give them nicotine-containing products, so nicotine replacement therapy. And they can use that not just as part of a cessation attempt, but they can use it while cutting down their smoking, because people who use NRT and cut down are more likely to quit in the longer term. And they can potentially use a nicotine-containing product for many years, if they choose to do so, if that avoids them relapsing to smoking. That is a national policy framework. It was designed around NRT, but we said in the guidance, nicotine-containing products because we knew there were other products coming on the market that if regulated appropriately could be very promising. And so these are some of the reports that our center, UK CTAST, Professor Jeff Collin is a member of this center and he's here. Uh, some of the reports the center produced for Public Health England and then most recently Jeff and I were both involved uh, in authoring the Royal College of Physicians report alongside many other authors which was published this year. And some of you may be familiar with the RCP report. So I'm just taking you through some of the evidence from these reports. Nicotine is crucial in all of this. What this slide shows you uh, um, briefly is on the far side, you have a smoker who wakes up in the morning at 8 o'clock. They have their cigarette within five minutes of waking, a key marker of nicotine dependence, as you know. They then have withdrawal symptoms. They need another cigarette. They smoke again, and that goes on through the day. And then some of the smokers we work with actually get up in the middle of the night to have a cigarette because they're experiencing nicotine withdrawal. And then if you expose people to low nicotine uh, cigarettes on the bottom half of, of this side, um, people will uh, titrate the level of nicotine they need in their system. So if they're exposed to lower levels of nicotine and a low nicotine containing cigarette, they take deeper draws, puff harder, smoke more of the cigarette, they compensate, and they're exposed to the same level of harm, the same level of of toxicants, particularly tobacco specific nitro nitrosamines when they do that. So smokers smoke for the nicotine. That's why they smoke, but there are other aspects as well. 
And unfortunately, the other things we have to offer people trying to stop smoking don't deliver nicotine as effectively as a cigarette. Look at the cigarette, the plasma nicotine spike in the far side of the chart. And then look at the contrast with uh, the nicotine gum and patch and also low nitrosamine tobacco products, Swedish snus, which is banned in the EU but available in Sweden. They don't, they're not the same. The nicotine delivery is not the same. So I'll come on to why that's relevant for e-cigarettes, but what's happening in one particular country with electronic cigarettes? Like the US, we've seen an explosion of use of these products. Just starting off, this is current smokers in England from 2007 to 2015. Look at that rise in electronic cigarette use. Um, and look at the slight decline in the, I've just found the laser, in the use of NRT. So now we have over one in five smokers in England who use an electronic cigarette. What about people who've recently stopped smoking? Over 40% of people who've recently stopped smoking in the United Kingdom and England are using an electronic cigarette. And some of these people have stopped smoking with using an electronic cigarette. But some of them will have used other things. And again, you see the decline in NRT. And here's where we start to get to the data that sometimes worries people or they really want to know about it. What about people who stopped smoking some time ago, even a few years ago? Well, long-term ex-smokers, some of them are using electronic cigarettes. This scale is different from the previous ones, but very few, um, just about, just under 5% are using an e-cigarette who are longer-term ex-smokers. And it's actually not that different from long-term ex-smokers who use NRT. I often use the example of my uncle who quit smoking 15 years ago and still uses the NRT lozenges every day, and he just finds them helpful uh, for him. Never smokers, this is the crucial one. These are adults in England. What proportion of people who've never smoked use an electronic cigarette in England? It's a tiny, tiny proportion. You can see the line here. It's less than half a percent. It's very similar to the proportion of adults who have never smoked and use nicotine replacement therapy. Do you know any never smokers who use NRT? There are some, but there are not very many of them. And crucially, what's happening with teenagers? So the US data, all the headlines you see from the CDC, they show this explosion in e-cigarette use. And there is an explosion in e-cigarette use, but it's e-cigarette experimentation. Um, and it's really very closely concentrated in kids who already smoke. So just to give you an example from the UK, this is a paper I did last year with some colleagues comparing a UK survey, Great Britain survey, Wales survey, Scotland survey, all with teenagers in the same year. Strikingly similar, 12% of all teenagers had tried an e-cigarette, that's a lot. But regular use is low, and I've just updated these figures for 2016, and basically what you see is this has gone up, this has gone up a bit, but this is almost unchanged. And I'll move on to these figures. So, this, these are the never smokers. These are the children we're really, we're really concerned about. How many of them are using an electronic cigarette in the UK? Well, in 2014, there was a, there was a sizable amount of experimentation amongst teenagers with these cigarettes, but there's almost no regular use amongst children who never smoke. And when you look at the US data, um, particularly one of the surveys, it's actually a very similar pattern. And it's more to do with the questions that are asked. Past 30 day use is not regular use of an electronic cigarette. Now, I'm not saying these figures will not change, and we should be concerned about experimentation, definitely. But at the moment, amongst teenagers, electronic cigarettes are being used by teenagers who already smoke. What about safety? Are electronic cigarettes safe? No, they're not. Uh, as we've heard from Ryan, there's plenty of substances in there that potentially should not be inhaled into the lungs. Are they safer than tobacco? If we're interested in supporting people to stop, that might be the appropriate comparison. Um, so just to summarize, because there's not much time in this presentation, this is a whole separate talk. Electronic cigarettes as part of a harm reduction strategy, in contrast to reduced risk cigarettes, of course, which were made by the tobacco industry and were not reduced risk at all, there's no combustion which takes place in e-cigarettes. In contrast to smokeless tobacco, e-cigarettes are not tobacco products. They do not contain tobacco. They contain nicotine and flavorings, which can be toxicants, but the toxicants present are at much lower levels in, than in tobacco, and that is the case if you look at the data carefully in any study. And all the evidence suggests that e-cigarettes are safer than tobacco cigarettes. And one estimate that we used in the RCP report, here they're referred to as ENDS, we estimated that e-cigarettes have around 5% of the risks of smoking. And this particular article was criticized, but when you look across the range of the data and evidence we have, that looks like a reasonable estimate. It may be too high, it may be not high enough. You know, the data will, will speak for themselves as we see more studies coming through. 
but I guess the harm from tobacco is so bad uh, that some of these alternatives are less harmful. Ryan's already said uh, about different devices. This makes researching them really difficult because this is not a single product class. Um, they're very varied in terms of there's sigillites, first generation, uh, rechargeable sigillites. Uh, these are almost entirely now, or many of them, made by the tobacco industry. The tobacco industry is not very active in the later generation devices, second and third generation refillables, probably for some good reasons. And the reason that's important is because amongst first generation devices, nicotine delivery is actually really quite poor. Compared to a cigarette, e-cigarette users who smoke a cigalite that looks like a cigarette, they don't get much nicotine. These are not effective smoking cessation aids. But the newer generation products look really, really promising, and I'm involved in a number of trials at the moment, and it's really interesting what's happening with people stopping smoking with e-cigarettes, but only if they deliver nicotine effectively, as some of the later products do. Just a couple more minutes, Essan, because I know I'm tight on time. In terms of toxicants, these are some of the common toxicants we see in tobacco, formaldehyde, acetaldehyde, um, the uh, tobacco-specific nitrosamines, and some of the heavy metals. And you can see these are present in electronic cigarette aerosol or vapor, but at far lower levels than in tobacco smoke. So not safe, but safer, and that is a crucial distinction. Uh, are they harmful to bystanders? We definitely need more data on this, and Ryan gave us an excellent presentation in the UK on this a few weeks ago. Uh, we know that they release nicotine into the ambient air. The nicotine is actually not something we should be terribly worried about, but it's probably some of the other toxicants that we need, need more research on. And interestingly, some of the studies in this area are really quite poor. The way we're measuring e-cigarette aerosol and comparing it with tobacco smoke uh, has not been well done so far. I think Ryan would agree we certainly need more research. Uh, two final points, first on smoking cessation and then harm perceptions. Whether we like it or not, in many developed countries, smokers have voted with their feet. They certainly have in the UK. They are now used in more than a third of quit attempts. And despite our excellent free at the point of use national treatment services for smokers, less than 5% of smokers choose to use them. They work, but they don't use them. They're using e-cigarettes. Um, so that's what's happening in practice. And the Cochrane Review, which was updated just uh, last month, overall, uh, the conclusion is that electronic cigarettes are promising for smoking cessation. There are many observational studies. There are only two high, higher quality uh, randomized control trials. But overall, Cochrane has graded the evidence as weak. There are more than 15 trials that are ongoing at the moment. So we will know more. But overall, uh, because they are nicotine delivery devices, they look like they may have some promise for smoking cessation and are probably about as effective as a single product of NRT. And this just gives you a couple more examples of studies that have been done that look at uh, smoking cessation uh, amongst people using e-cigarettes. And, and again, the overall evidence is looking very promising in that regard, but only for particular type, types of devices. Uh, really, for some product categories, they are not effective. Um, and this is the key thing, uh, again, running out of time slightly, but this is just contrasting people who don't use e-cigarettes. Uh, cigarette, e this is for cessation. Don't use it every day. Do use it every day. These are the first generation cigalites that look like cigarettes. Don't use a second or third generation, generation every day and do use one every day. And look at that difference in quit rates. If you use a tank model daily and you're trying to stop smoking, you probably have a better chance than, than these other product categories, and that's important. And in the UK, we now have uh, guidance for our health services, which essentially says that health professionals cannot recommend and cannot prescribe an e-cigarette. We do have one with a medicinal license, but it's not available. I'm skeptical as to whether it ever will be available, that particular one. Uh, but our health professionals can talk to people about e-cigarettes. And if they're choosing to use them, smokers, then they can receive behavioral support to stop smoking from our services. So finally, one of the things that really concerns me, and I think um, you know, my priority is that we do good quality studies and get the evidence across, is that uh, smokers and the public, and there was a, a, a journal article published last week in the US that shows this as well. This is 2013, and that's 2016. These adults were asked, did they think that e-cigarettes were more or equally harmful compared to tobacco, less harmful, or these other categories? Look at the proportion of UK adults that believe e-cigarettes are more or equally harmful when compared to tobacco. It's now one in four. And from all the evidence we have, for all the studies that have been done, that is not the case. So we have to ask why that, is a, why that misperception is occurring. 
and it's the same in smokers. So just a final thought. Um, I spend most of my time nowadays looking at the research. I, I edit a monthly evidence briefing for Cancer Research UK, and we've set up a UK electronic cigarette research forum, and we've worked with John Hopkins and their Harvesting Global Learning Initiative, which is about cross-country comparisons. And I really believe, just like tobacco control, we've achieved so much by working together, looking at the evidence, and advocating for evidence-based policies. We have a responsibility to continue to do that, and so we need to familiarize ourselves, those of us for whom it is relevant, with the evidence on e-cigarettes. Keep tracking it and keep an open mind about changing our views and our policies if we see new evidence emerging. And this is just one example of a group that's trying to do this. And if you're interested in our briefing, please let me know. So I, I won't go through the conclusions, but I hope that provides a useful summary, um, and I look forward to questions and discussions. Thank you. Thank you. And any qu clarifying questions? Uh, so we have got one here. Do we have a mic? Yeah, I think, I mean, I chaired the, the National Guidance on Tobacco Harm Reduction. And when we were talking about harm reduction there, actually, we were talking about the fact that tobacco is so harmful. Let's reduce the harm. But you're absolutely right. The nuances around language, I think, are important. Um, we actually do use the term less harmful in, a, in a, quite a lot of the documentation. But I, I say that the, the emphasis is it's not safe. It may be safer. But I think um, harm reduction as a framework, I absolutely agree with you, is a far more useful uh, terminology to use and, and one we should probably use more consistently. So thank you for that. Thank you, Linda. <coughs> uh, towards the end, thank you. Because the next ex speaker is really excellent. He needs to present. <laughs> and he, he needs more time as the chair, so, so I'll go over there and then. Well, uh, you're in the right order. You want to go first? Yeah, if it's up there, it's, why, why not? Yeah. Why, thank you for that introduction. <laughs> so this is my very dear colleague, Myra. Myra is our consultant uh, for a lot of things that we use her for, but mainly for the grants program that we run from the International Union. And Myra has got years of experience on tobacco control and looking at the framework convention. So over to you, Myra. And I, I, I said the right thing. This is an excellent speaker. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Essen, and thank you, Ryan and Linda. Um, let me just say that Essen sold you a bill of goods on me. I'm a generalist, and I'm surrounded by some experts here. Um, I'm gonna take a broad brush, broad brush approach. I have no real perceived or direct or indirect conflicts of interest. But I'm going to take a broad brush approach to talking about the impact on end of ENDS on the FCTC. Um, I'm going to highlight some specific examples of the impact on specific articles, and then share some of the policy guidance in a document that has been prepared for the Conference of Parties, which, as many of you know, is in Mumbai at the end of this month. Delhi. Pardon? Delhi. Delhi, excuse me. And here I am worried that I'm going to have inaccurate information about ENDS. <laughs> and, and I'm talking about FCTC. OK. I can't quite see the audience, but if anybody is not familiar with the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, raise your hand. All right, good. We can skip this slide. Um, the only thing I would like to highlight um, is that this public health treaty came into effect in 2005. 
ENDS REALLY EMERGED STRONGLY IN THE MARKET IN 2004. AND SO HERE WE ARE. THE HORSE IS OUT OF THE BARN AND WE'RE CHASING IT IN TERMS OF REGULATION. The, framework, the framers of the FCTC did not have ECs or ENDS in mind. And so when I pulled this presenta presentation together, I looked back at the reports that had been prepared for the Conference of Parties, the governing body for the Framework Convention, um, which of course is the decision-making body, provides guidance, to the parties on implementation. And in the COP4 report, it really identified there is a regulatory gap with this rapidly emerging product. COP5 and 6, the idea was to gather more evidence on the science base, because FCTC, of course, has to be evidence-based. The science-based, better understanding of what the regulatory frameworks are in various countries, uh, the sales, the marketing, um, anything on health impact, efficacy and cessation. And of note particular, the report for COP6, and many of you are probably quite familiar with this, really explicitly acknowledged this schism in the public health community with those feeling like this is going to be very helpful in addressing the epidemic and those feeling that it is just the devil incarnate. I don't have a cartoon for that. Um, COP7 builds on that and let me just move to some selected articles. 5.2, addressing nicotine addiction. 5.3, a big one, protecting from commercial interests and the tobacco industry. Article 8, protection from secondhand smoke. 12, denormalization of tobacco use. 13.2, TAPS bans, and then evidence-based treatment. And I have to say, I learned quite a bit from your presentation. Thank you. I, OK. This is a blog. It is Mr. Long Drag blog. And it's why I will never stop vaping. Um, he writes, I need my nicotine fix. So Article 5.2 commits parties not only to preventing and reducing t tobacco consumption and exposure to tobacco smoke, but preventing and reducing nicotine addiction independently from its source. So yes, medicinal use of ENDS e-cigarettes is certainly a public health option under the treaty and can be pursued, um, but recreational use is not. And when we look at the advertisements we see and we hear from this Mr. Long Drag um, that there is a big recreational use. Other concerns um, that the COP report notes is the concern about is it a gateway effect? Some of the stuff in the US is suggesting that um, non-smokers are taking up e-cigarettes and more likely to smoke cigarettes. Also, dual use, and I was um, struck by Jeff's presentation this morning where he uh, highlighted some information from Philip Morris International site where they are interested not only in convincing their adult smokers to quit and use reduced risk products, in other words, their ends, but also they want to lead the cigarette category around the world. So. We do need to be cautious. All right, this is the juicy stuff. This is what we all like to see. Um, tobacco industry, the transnational tobacco companies have been increasingly moving into the ENDS market. In 2015, it was a $10 billion market. Um, we can look very quickly at the major companies and their brands. 
I was really pleased to hear Linda say, and that she must have been talking about VOC, which was recently licensed um, in the UK as marketing authorization, that it may not come to market. Um, but the concern, of course, is that this is a BAT subsidiary. And interestingly enough, I just read that BAT is hoping to buy out Reynolds America for about $47 billion. And then they would basically be the world-class pipeline of vape and heated tobacco heating products around the world. Elif brought my attention to Philip Morris International's science uh, project, which is focused entirely on reduced risk products. Uh, $2 billion has gone into it, 430 scientists and staff. And it's also interesting to look at this headline here in terms of positioning them as a good guy. Scientists are joining tobacco companies to fight cancer. I love my cartoons. This is the fox in the chicken coop. So yes, the transnational um, tobacco industry influence is, can definitely be a threat to tobacco control and the FCTC. Um, simply looking at the act of vaping through ads and promotion um, it does promote the smoking behavior um, as a complement to tobacco, not an alternative. They are moving into controlling the technological innovations. And can we trust this industry to have effective products? Well, that remains to be seen. Um, and then this is also a foot in the door for them to engage with policymakers, It blurs the lines, as other speakers have commented in earlier presentations. And of course, there's the concern about research that they fund. Protection from secondhand smoke. Well, it's vaping looks like smoking. Think of the kids who have grown up in smoke-free environments and they see people vaping. Um, this is a bit of a concern. I'm running through this fairly quickly because you probably have lots you want to talk about and Essence still has to go. Um, the advertising incites rebellion against smoke-free policies. These are older ads. Um, however, we're looking at, oops, I'm sorry, uh, and the impact of secondhand aerosol. Um, there, again, there's not much that we know, but there is the potential for risk. Definitely less than conventional combusted tobaccos. Banning tobacco advertising promotion and sponsorship, Article 13.2. Well, we've seen the same old type of advertising for e-cigarettes. I don't have to show a lot of slides. Actually, I was thinking other speakers would be showing all kinds of slides with these, so I didn't have very many. Um, but parties have an obligation to undertake a comprehensive ban of tobacco advertising, promotion, and sponsorship. Um, in COP5 report, parties can consider whether the sale, advertising, and even use of ends can be considered as promoting tobacco, either directly or indirectly. Um, but whether they contain tobacco, nicotine, or extracts, they mimic the act of smoking, which may be considered promoting it. So here we've got Satisfy Your Urge. This is from Nigeria. Smoke Without Boundaries. This ad is from India. And then, of course, the glamorous smoke in style. When we look at tobacco advertising, promotion, and sponsorship, it is a nice lead-in to denormalize the Article 12, which is to denormalize the use of tobacco. And certainly, um, I lost my train of thought. Bear with me.
ends runs counter to the denormalization of tobacco use. There was a 2015 study that found that just watching people vape stimulates cravings among smokers and um, they are, they, their willpower is less in quitting smoking. So Article 14, well, of course there's controversy about this. Um, I was really pleased to hear and learn about what's happening in the UK, and I think that this is gonna be a great learning opportunity for the entire field um, in seeing the impact of e-cigarettes as long as they're regulated. This slide really highlights, should clinicians recommend e-cigarettes to their patients? Yes, no. Is this our choice? Or are there other options? So, FCTC COP report did not mandate, but invites parties to consider prohibiting and regulate or regulating ends to consider banning or restricting advertising, promotion, and sponsorship, and to comprehensively monitor their use. So those are general policy recommendations. The principles or the principal objectives have not changed, but it's essentially to prevent initiation, minimize potential his health risks to users and non-users, prevent unproven health claims from being made, and to protect tobacco activities from commercial interests, and especially the tobacco industry. I think the key po one of the key points here is that there are different political, economic, um, technical situations in different countries, and so different countries will need to address this in their own way and adapt according to the evolving science. So the COP7 report is essentially an update and provided some um, proposed specific regulatory options for parties that have not already banned ends. And it's not exhaustive. I'm gonna run through this. How's my time? You're doing good. Okay. I'm gonna go through this very quickly and just highlight a few things. I recall in a session yesterday, um, some people were talking about what options do we have, and Ryan um, highlighted many of the options that are already being undertaken. In terms of preventing initiation by non-smokers and youth, youth um, oops, did I get ahead of myself? Oh, no. I think the one that caught my eye is taxing. Uh, we need to make sure that if they're taxed, it should be to make it unaffordable or uh, less available for uptake by young people. However, it still has to be less than traditional combustible cigarettes. In terms of minimizing the potential risks to users, and non-users from exposure. We've gotta be able to test the heated ingredients, withdraw those from the market that are toxologi toxologically harmful. Labeling, safety, disclosure, product disclosure. Require the manufacturers to monitor And then in terms of non-users, prohibit their use in indoor spaces or at least where smoking is not permitted. Now I did read something recently and was talking about it with Ryan earlier, that if, if there is a situation where we are encouraging people to use e-cigarettes as a way to quit smoking, but we don't allow them to use them indoor, uh, we've got a little balancing to do. Um, definitely need health warnings, warnings on the addictive nature of nicotine, 
and of course, child resistant packaging leak proof containers. Definitely in preventing unproven health claims from being made about ends, ensure that a government agency has approved them if they're being promoted for a cessation aid. These are options being taken and prohibit implicit or explicit claims about their comparative safety unless it's been approved by a government agency. In other words, we don't want the industry doing this. This needs to be regulated. Article 5.3 deserved its own page for the list. And uh, as Jeff noted this morning, this is where we really need to be vigilant. Uh, the, the promise of e-cigarettes may be there, but the threat is that this is simply a backdoor for the industry to maintain the loyalty to their other products and get in with policymakers. So is it a threat? Is it a promise? As Essen is going to talk about, this is really complex. And where you push in one area, it probably bulges out in another. So in order to address this, we have to stay focused. What is the big picture? It's combustible tobacco, so let's not get distracted. And let's also ensure that we are united as we pursue our public health objectives. Thank you. Thanks, Mara. Uh, so we'll take questions at the end. I'll quickly go through my presentation from there. It keeps going back to the. Hello. Hi, can you put the presentation on, please? Am I pressing the right button? It's the next, isn't it? Yeah. Can somebody knock on that window or something? Is there anybody in there? <laughs> I'll keep doing this till it comes up. Really sorry, apologies for this. The chair should have done a better job. <laughs> for, for complexity. It is, yeah. Right, good, it's there. So this is not a very really scientific uh, presentation. It is a collection of things that I keep hearing from different tobacco control advocates from a range of countries and across the globe mostly low and middle income countries with very weak or still designing uh, tobacco control policies or frameworks. So bear with us when we do this, but there are certain undeniable facts that we have learned over the years, along with the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, that a lot of people die from tobacco use. We, nobody can deny that. And most of these deaths occur in the low and middle income countries. And we, we it, those who belong to the low and middle income countries see these uh, every day. And there are projections on how many people will die by the 21st century. And children and adults employed in the tobacco farming uh, are vulnerable to green tobacco sickness. So some of the facts which we all agree upon as we do tobacco control across the globe. But some of the other things that you need to consider is those are that tobacco control always needs to be a global effort. That's why the Framework Convention was hailed as a global solution to a global problem. 
no single country can handle tobacco use on its own. It has to play a part in the whole global community. Look at the illicit trade protocol, for example. You can't do illicit trade protocol by one country. It has to be all the countries in the region with their joining borders. So we need a holistic response. We need a global response. And if we only focus on the health side of things, and in my opinion, we will be going back 40, 50 years when people said smoking, individual choice, it affects your health, and nobody even considered the economic, social, environmental impacts of tobacco use. They only came into our consideration when the Framework Convention or the World Bank uh, launched this report curbing the epidemic. So history tells us we can never trust the tobacco industry, and that's also a truth. Nobody can deny or can say, no, we can trust the tobacco industry, no matter in what shape, size, or form. And then there is evidence for and against the e-cigarettes. In my opinion, we have not conclusively proven without doubt that electronic cigarettes are safe. There are reviews you read one day which say they are safe. You can use them. They are less harmful. There is a good room for harm reduction. And the next day, you see another review saying, no, that's not correct. There are things which the use of electronic cigarettes can lead to. They might not be looking at nicotine. They might be looking at some of the constituents of the e-liquids or those blowing up inside the plane. That's why you have a precautionary now that you need to carry it with you on your luggage, which you can take into the cabin, but not check them in into your main suit, suitcases. Sorry. So there are lots of debates on in papers on harm reduction as a cessation device, alternate to all forms of tobacco use, nicotine dependence, gateway to smoking, and all you see for and against arguments on this. I just wanted to share something. Uh, Myra is my mentor in, in most of the things, so she has taught me how to use cartoons. So I just wanted to show this to you, that what's the likely caption here? There can be different answers. So if you look at the pollution outside in a factory, so someday, son, you will have a job here. So that's one way of looking at it. Or what, he, what we can say is, all this will be your problem. So right now, we are solving the problem. But then again, let the future generations think of how the environmental impact is going to be. Or this will make you rich, certainly very relative to the tobacco industry. Or you'll thank me for this, because if everything works, all the three above ABC are working, then you will thank me for this, or hate me for this, for that matter. All our children hate us anyway, but <laughs> this, this, this will just add to the debate. Uh, so I just wanted to think what would happen the next 10 years if we go and say that electronic cigarettes are good for us, they are safe, they are letting a lot of people quit. So let's, let's just for a minute suppose that the leading health experts in this world come to us and say, it has been proven beyond doubt that electronic cigarettes have negligible health risk, and millions of smokers have switched to it, with makers of e-cigarettes providing the innovation and continuing to explore ways to make these safer. So we hear about this, and then we say, fine, it's a good statement like the Framework Convention, and let's get with it and move forward. But my, I have a problem, because I want to see the problem. I'm too paranoid not to look at the problems and read between the lines. So my question, the, ask, the question that I ask myself is, what is the problem? And can you spot the problem in all the normal things that you can see from Star Wars? The first problem that comes to my mind is, and on discussion with the people on the ground is, the tobacco industry is buying all these electronic cigarettes. They are owning. In China, we heard during this conference that there are millions of, or if not millions, thousands and thousands of electronic cigarettes in warehouses in China ready to be exported to the rest of the world. And they are not going to come to the UK. They are going to go to all the other low and middle income countries, including Africa, Asia, Latin America, and everywhere. And who's producing them? The biggest 
tobacco industry in this world, which is China Tobacco, which is a monopoly of the Chinese government. And we just heard about the 47 million takeover of R.J. Reynolds, which will make BAT the other biggest company. So tobacco industry has given us this headache for the last, I don't know how many years. So my problem is that they will both own the problem and they will also own the solution. And Mayra has shown you this, but I just want to do a comparison between what they told us in the 1960s and what they are telling us now. Same advertising, same things, but it's good to say that in the high income countries, there are regulatory laws and we can ban tobacco advertising promotion and sponsorship. But if you count the countries who have banned it for the cigarette uh, advertising, there aren't enough. And we still need to do more on that. So advertising, so take back your freedom. Again, comparisons, almost the same. And I've said this in previous presentation, even the hairstyle looks the same. <laughs> At least he has a hairstyle. <laughs> and then the flavoring. These come in all kinds of flavoring. And I'll, I'm going to share an experience with you. I was in a shopping mall with my daughter who is, at that time she was 15, she's now 16. And this person approached her who was selling e-cigarettes and he asked her, do you love your dad? And she said, no, so we walked on. <laughs> <laughs> what, she, what she said, no, why, why are you asking this? That if your dad smokes, ask him to come to our stand and look at all these lovely e-cigarette. And I, I just stood there, I didn't know what to say. Because this person approaching a teenager, not me directly, but a teenager, and she doesn't look old. She, she's petite, she's small. She can't mistake her for somebody who's 20, 30 years old. But just approaching it here in the UK uh, on e-cigarettes. So you've got flavors, you've got apple jack cereal, and then you've got games. You know, all of us get bored from presentations. And somebody at the back might be playing a game now. But e-cigarettes add appears in kid games and iPad games. And what we also know is that nicotine is one of the most addictive chemicals known to mankind. And this is not my statement. This has been proven scientifically. The other problem that I have is that we want to put harm reduction in perspective in, the, in a context. It's good to say that this electronic cigarette is good for a smoker's health. It will help them to quit and overall decrease the burden of disease uh, that we face today. But there is a whole list of things which goes on in the background. And that has to do with our social aspects, the economic aspects, the environmental aspects. All of us are concerned with sources of nicotine and harm reduction. I, I don't know, I'm not an expert in nicotine, but what I believe is that nicotine will continue to come from the tobacco leaf because that's the cheapest form of nicotine. I tried to do a search on what would be the comparative cost, but I couldn't find one. But generally what the papers say is that synthetic nic nicotine is way too expensive to be used in these electronic cigarettes. So it has to come from tobacco farming. So if we are trying to give tobacco industry another chance of exploiting the tobacco farmers, we have not dealt with it under the framework convention. We recently celebrated 10 years of the FCTC coming into force. But how much have we done on tobacco farming? I think minimal. We have got delegates from Brazil, we have got delegates from India, everything but people not switching from farming. And if we create a demand of switching all of this world's smokers into electronic nicotine devices users, what will happen to these farmers and how do we address alternate livelihoods? So are we saying that is green sickness acceptable to us? Should we continue to let these people grow nicotine for the electronic cigarettes? Maybe they'll be producing less, but there'll still be people 
like this who undergo child labor. And we know about the exploitation of the industry. So do we trust the industry? No, we don't. I've got some issues with the pro-e-cigarette policies and approaches as well. And as I said in, the, in one of the earlier slides, it to me it appears to be a developed country approach with good laws, good system, good resources, where you can go to the people, educate them. I've been living in Scotland for some time now, and when the ban came, next day, everybody started following it. If you tell them now that you're not allowed to smoke somewhere or you're not allowed to use electronic cigarettes, they will follow it. They understand the importance of that law. But tell that to a person in a country where I come from, which is Pakistan, it will take me years to educate the public. Tahir from the World Lung Foundation, now Vital Strategies, is with us. He can tell you how difficult it is to educate and raise awareness in those low and middle income countries. And then, as the previous slides, I think, showed you that the smoker's health is not the only concern that we have. It is the main concern. We want to keep tobacco use and all the policies under the health domain. But there are other multiple things that we are looking into. And there is no reference to the FCTC Article 5.3, tobacco agriculture, how do we address that, and other issues, for example, livelihood of retailers, child labor, and et cetera. But the main problem and the challenge that all of us are going to face is that this is creating confusion in our minds. And it is not good for anyone. It has also got the potential of dividing us into pro electronic cigarettes or again against electronic cigarettes. And that's not what we want. We are all in here for reducing the harms caused by electronic cigarettes and reducing the harm for everybody in the tobacco use chain. So it's not just the smoker, it's the person on the ground who starts growing tobacco, who's working on the farms, to the people involved in tobacco trade, the retailers, the sellers, whose livelihood is dependent upon this. We have not been able to look into those. But it is really, really important that we talk about everybody in the chain and not just the end user. And what we really, really need to avoid is confusion. Please let not send a signal to the industry that half of us are leaning towards this and half of us aren't, or whatever the proportion is. We need to stand united, have a global dialogue on this, and come up with a solution which does not only work for the developed countries, but also works for the low and middle income countries and everybody across the globe. Because as I said, this is a global problem. So Myra talked about the Article 5.3 in electronic cigarettes. Will Article 5.3 be applicable? How do we ensure transparency? Will the interactions between departments and ministries of health limit to e-cigarettes? Or will these be used similar to those the CS CSR activities? We know the ministries of health in, in low and middle income countries, as soon as there is a flood, the shares of the tobacco industry go up just because they are in a position to lend funds to the ministries, to the flood relief camps. They have a photo opportunity and then they get the policy that they want and stop our work. So will tobacco control advocates join forces with e-cigarettes arm of the tobacco industry to promote their products or is accepting funds from manufacturers of e-cigarettes ethical? So a lot of questions that we need to think as we move forward. I don't have the answers. I might be entirely wrong here. People may have thought about these answers as they have gone along discovering what electronic cigarettes are. But we really, really need to answer them because there are a lot of people out there who are working on tobacco control who want to know what to say to a government that should they introduce electronic cigarettes or shouldn't they introduce electronic cigarettes. I'm also not for in a favor of the two extremes that we allow electronic cigarettes to become the only cessation device on one end or we completely ban them on the other. Because down the road we might discover that electronic cigarettes were good for us and we didn't answer the right question 
uh, to our future generations. So we need to keep our minds open uh, on different possibilities. So this might change tomorrow, but given the evidence that we have right now, what the union with its experience of working in low and middle income countries is saying, you need to keep focusing on the real subject, which is tobacco control and pass laws and policies and make countries compliant with FCTC articles. In the meantime, what you can do is that you can regulate the manufacturing, marketing, and sale of electronic cigarettes as cessation devices through the in-country drug regulatory authorities. It's, if you are promoting it as a cessation device, as something which helps the smokers to quit and decreases the harms from the tar and the smoke and everything else which is used by them when they smoke, just give it to your drug regulatory authorities. Then the onus will not be on us to prove whether they are safe or not. The onus will be on the manufacturers of the e-cigarettes. And they'll have to go through a rigorous system of proving that they are safe beyond doubt. They can be used in a cost-effective manner, and they can also be added to the WHO's essential drug list. So that's what we are recommending. I might change my mind in the next presentation and say something different, because this is based on the evidence that we have. And the evidence is still not conclusive. But in discussions, we think that this is one of the way that we can move forward to avoid confusion. And again, I, uh, we like to put up this slides that, have they been proved to be safe? Mr. Kullman, Mr. Kullman replies, I believe they have not been proved to be unsafe. <laughs> so we are, we are facing this confusion. We are facing this dilemma where we have to look at the developed countries, the low and middle income countries, the frameworks that we have. So we, we need to get our act together. We need to sound, sing from the same hymn sheet. People in my country would kill me if I sing from a hymn sheet, but no problems. <laughs> <laughs> I can still do that because I'm in Scotland now. But we need to, we need to have the same voice. So for whatever Professor Linda is, <coughs> Mr. Bo Professor Linda is recommending is the one that I should recommend. And what I'm recommending to a low and middle income countries should be similar to what is happening in Brazil or the tobacco growing areas. So it has to be all unified. And that, that's my request to you and my, uh, one of the takeaways for you is, let's get our act together. Let's recommend something which is applicable across the globe and not just the developed countries. So thank you very much for listening. <clears throat> and thank you to all the other uh, presenters uh, for presenting today. So I'll take on my chair's hat now and open the floor uh, for questions. I'm sure there are. Uh, Hassan from Maldives had a question. So uh, what I've been told is that there are two mics on both ends, but if you have a good voice like mine, you can just shout and not use the mic. So you, and please introduce yourself and also. Thank you. So go ahead, Hassan. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, my name is Hassan Mohammed. I'm from the Maldives. Um, uh, this is very humbling. I'm really naive on many of these issues. And these presentations have opened my eyes. My question could be a bit long, but I try to be very short. <laughs> Um, I was in the plenary, um, the presentation in the plenary and this presentation. When I marry these two, I get both a um, comedy and a horror story together. The comedy is, that it's really funny that the tobacco industry says that they want to sell harmless products and give up selling tobacco. Well, I say, good for you. I, I, we know tobacco affects your intelligence, the users, but 
We don't know it affects the sellers that way. But then comes the public health people, the governments. We are smarter. So why are we pushing this distorted idea that somehow we have to keep a, our people addicted to something, nicotine? So these are the questions from the presentations, Linda and Myra, and also, I, I can't remember the name over right. there. Yeah, we have learned that nicotine, we, we haven't got any say that nicotine is beneficial to human body. We also know that this, the people around cigarette smoking, there's, a, there's an effect to others that has not been proven. We know that from Linda's presentation that those teenagers or those who are small, who are using e-cigarettes are not doing so because it is less harm, because they believe it is less harmful. There's a big difference from harm less and less harm, just changing the word. And we still have those cancer causing elements in the e-cigarettes. And we have proven cessation programs where we use standard regular cessation devices. Have they been proven ineffective? Now that we have to find something, we know these devices are be being designed in a way that they look similar to a cigarette. So this is to incite in <coughs> you know, and I really like you, but I need to stop. You yeah, here. yeah. So, so uh, the question is now: We know, end of the day, those who are addicted to nicotine, those children or teenagers, we know cigarettes still have nicotine. Why wouldn't they smoke cigarette later on? A lot of and, questions. Yeah. Yes. But, but and and what are the what are the health warnings that you put on the e-cigarettes? Yes, that's, what, that's what we are all of us are trying to communicate that there are lots of questions we still need to answer there's some good evidence and then some controversial evidence but we need to work together to answer all of those but very good points raised by you Elif thank you very much Ehsan uh, you clarified a lot of points because uh, from the other end of Europe UK, UK perspective on electronic cigarette uh, looked like Brexit to us <laughs> Uh, uh, so uh, I, I know that y there are conflicting opinions even in UK. My question is, we hear that UK had done all good best practice policies and could not reduce the consumption rate. There are still smokers. And there are people from Australia here and they have done very good policies as well why their smoking rates are going down and they can project that they can hit zero even. Is, th is there a difference between two countries from policy perspective so that we don't have to use electronic cigarettes all over the world? So we, all, we always have big debates about the Australian versus the UK data. So I think the key thing to emphasize is that the inequalities in smoking rates in Australia are very significant. If you go and, and work with Australian colleagues, I'm sure you have done smoking rates amongst Aboriginal Australians, amongst low-income women and men, amongst prisoners and people with mental health problems. In, in some cases, they are just as high as they are in, in the UK. So though Australia has low smoking rates, and we've actually achieved 1% reductions each year over the last decade, so we're now down to 17% in England, um, they still have big groups of smokers. So I don't think, sadly, I don't think Australia has cracked it. I think they've made fantastic progress, but they still have, you know, the, the challenge of how do we really support all those groups um, to stop. And I, I think, you know, in an ideal world, we would never have had cigarettes. They would not be available. They would be prohibited. Um, but that's where we are. And it is very challenging, I agree. Anyone? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I actually belong to the, extra, uh, the other extreme, uh, where I believe the e-cigarettes should be banned. In Punjab, actually Linda quoted uh, Punjab, 
in Punjab, uh, actually Drug and Cosmetic Act is Pan India Act and uh, under the Drug and Cosmetic Act, uh, nicotine is only allowed as uh, nicotine gums, lozenges and patches. So everything else is illegal. So on that basis, we have declared e-cigarettes as illegal. And as Linda uh, told you, uh, one person has been, in, in fact, convicted for selling e-cigarette. And many five, six cases are going on. They, and they are definitely going to be convicted. Uh, we are just moving people from one harmful product to another more harmful product. I, this is my belief. I was part of the WHO consultation which happened in Panama. And uh, most of the countries, they were uh, represented, uh, there were representation for most of the countries. And most of the people, they are still struggling with regulation of e-cigarettes. We have not been able to regulate in hundreds of years, we have not been able to regulate tobacco. And I'm sure we will not be able to regulate e-cigarettes. So I think it should be banned. And this is the right time. And uh, this COP7, that should be conveyed uh, to everyone clearly that it has to be banned and nothing else will do. Thank you. Thank you for the comments. Uh, and I, I just want to add to that, that every country has a unique situation. They understand their country better on what works for them. Uh, we can generalize it to all the uh, 192 countries who are members of the uh, WHO, but we can't say that one solution will fix everything. So you need to look at it, but my request to you, sir, would be that keep an open mind. Don't shut your doors just now. Keep an open mind, continue to observe what's happening globally, continue to look at the evidence which is coming in. And if at some stage there is a possibility of electronic cigarettes playing a role, then we should grab that opportunity because we are still struggling with tobacco control. But only if it is proven that they have, these products have a role. So my, my request is just keep your minds and hearts open to uh, different possibilities in your own countries. Any other uh, questions before we wrap it up? And um, I couldn't resist um, having to comment as an Australian because I think um, there is a lot to learn when you compare countries. Um, uh, but I do really agree with Hassan's point about there's a very big difference between developed countries and the low to middle income countries. Because when we, uh, in, in Australia, they have banned, a lot of the, our state and territory governments have banned electronic cigarettes until the evidence is clear that um, they are less harmful. Uh, and uh, until that happens, um, you know, we, I think it's better to, to be uh, cautious. But we have got so many other things in place. I mean, a packet of cigarettes is, is going from 30, you know, close to $30 to $40 a pack in Australia. So, you know, you, I wouldn't want, uh, you know, countries that are struggling to, uh, to compare themselves too much to the developed countries because I think there are, are major differences. So I think Isan's right about... Uh, what might work in in the uh, you know in the more developed countries will that work? It may not work in um, low to middle income countries, and perhaps we've got a few other New Zealanders and Australians here, so they might like to uh, comment as well because uh, I think the um, we have got smoking rates down to twelve percent, but that's because of a comprehensive strategy. Any other uh, questions before we wrap it up? Okay. So thank you for coming. Thank you for taking part in this debate. Uh, it's, it's a really complex uh, subject, and we need to continue discussing it till we come to the right answers uh, which are applicable to all the countries that we work in. So thank you very much for coming today.